thank him for the cross of Jesus. For what he did for you on the cross. Mean it. Say it a minute. Take your time and pray. Thank him for what he has done for you on the cross. name we pray. Father, we thank you this evening. The entrance of your word gives a light and it gives understanding to the simple. We come with simple hearts. Let your word change us. Let your word bear fruit in us. Give everyone here a testimony. Give everyone here a reason to celebrate. Let revelation, mighty, mighty revelation happen to everyone in this meeting that will bring about changes in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. I said in Jesus' name we pray. Yes. Today is the what? The 11. Do you still have your momentum? Have you lost it? Are you still energetic? Are you still expectant? Can we shout a very big amen this evening? Walk up to two persons by your side. Tell them what you are expecting for this service this evening. Mm, tell them. Two persons. Yes. Tell them what you are expecting. So that the person will be sure that he's sitting around the right person. And not sitting around the distraction. Hallelujah. God bless you. You might be seated. It's been a journey, right? Glory to God. It's been a journey. So we are still teaching on Oikos. Hallelujah. You know, actually, when the Lord opened my eyes to, when the Lord began to talk to me, rather, about this very teaching, I thought um, I thought that was going to be the the theme for Zoe. You understand? Uh, that's the way God speaks. For a very long time. If I had almost announced it once only. You understand? But the Holy Ghost said, wait. I'd already written it, I'd already prepared the templates to send to the designers to start working on it. So what will be all it Glory to God. And, um, you know, in that process, so I was praying one day for Zoe, just one night around 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. in the morning, and the Lord spoke to me, said, a generation in prophecy. That's what Zoe will be. So I was like, ah, Father, I've preached that message before. <laughs> you know, you know, I've preached that message before. Uh, God said, well, that's Zoe thing. So and I said, all oh, this one you've been showing me because I've, I've, I was already working on this thing diligently. He just said, keep walking. So I didn't even know that was what we we're going to do in this meeting. So it was much later that the Lord said, well, this is what you'll be teaching. And glory to God, you know, that we are dealing with this in this particular time. If it was always, always just four days. Do you understand what I'm saying? We would have just rushed and combed everything and you get hyped up and all of that. But you know, in these 30 days, we have time. Glory to God. That's the beauty of long meetings and long teachings. We have time. So we're going to stay on this. You know, I, I, I thought, I, what I planned to do earlier was to see if I can teach on Oikos for like 20 days or 21 days, then shift. But the way it's going, I don't know. Let's just be moving. Glory to God. Because we are making progress, but my note is not making progress. Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Have you been getting blessed? Okay, so 
Let's have our board again. Today is Oikos, day 11. So the first two days, let me just refresh your mind. The first two days, I taught you on looking for the house of God. Remember that? Looking for God's house. And, you know, saying this to even the people that will be the media team that will be getting this on YouTube, getting this on, on the site and all of that, each of these days should have their subtopics. So Oikos, looking for God's house. A and B. I get the point. So that is oil coast for God's house. Then after that, we move to the purity of God's house. Amen. I think that one had A, B, and C. Three days, the purity of God's house. Then after that, we move to angels in the house of God. Angels in God's house. Angels in God's house. So that one took us, that's taken us like five days now. I don't worry, we are done with that. Do you understand the point? So I'm saying because I'm about to open up something else. This is how it is good to study the Bible. Amen. So I'll, I'll open up something else today. I called it the glory of this letter house. The glory of this letter house. So, so this would take us, if you are here and you have interest in spiritual things, and all of that, we are about to get into it now. In the next 10 days, it's going to be amazing. Hallelujah. There will be spiritual moves and all of that. Are you ready? The glory of this letter house. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So, he, Habakkuk, okay, sorry, Haggai rather. Haggai 2 verse 1. Haggai 2 verse 1. Glory to God. You know we are the house of God, right? We are the house of God. In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shatiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes and the comparison of it as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, said the Lord. And be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. And be strong, all ye people of the land, said the Lord, and walk. I am with you, a lot of hope. So let me just explain a few things, just to give you the background of the story. Okay, they had built, you remember, in the other time I showed you, they had many temples they were building. And so this one time when the house of God was raided, and they were rebuilding that house. And then the word of the Lord came, because they, I told you, every time they were done rebuilding the house, they get very moody, they start crying, because it is nothing close to what Solomon did. And what is, was it that Solomon did? Solomon built his own entire house with gold. He built it with gold from beginning to end. Everything. If not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about gold-plated wristwatch that you're wearing. Gold. Real gold. Say amen. You know, that's that's gold-plated wristwatch. That when, once you bath with it, it changes color. Glory to God. I say glory to God. You know, gold is a very expensive commodity. Right? The world's resource is, is still, I think, Bitcoin doesn't even come close. After real estate, you have gold. So it's still, if it's something that can never de- be real gold, it can never depreciate. But it's a, it's a good place to save your money. You know, right? It's a good way to save your money. You can use your money and buy raw gold and keep it, it will always appreciate. Always. It's not like land. No, land always appreciates, but then it, they cannot tell you, it depends on whether government will build road here. Or what. <laughs> this one will always appreciate. Glory to God. So, these guys at the time could no longer afford all of those extravagant things that Solomon did in his temple. So, it was nothing to them. So, God was telling them, how many of you saw this house in its last glory? She doesn't make any sense to you now. Now, he said, but then encourage yourself. I'm dude. Now, verse 5. 
according to the word that I covenanted with you, when ye came out of Egypt, so my spirit remained among you. He said, Fear ye not. For thus says the Lord, the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. He said, Yet a little while. In other words, I'm about to do something again. For, okay, now, verse 7. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory. He said, Lord of hosts, he said, I will fill this house with glory. Now, what is he, is he talking about? Let's proceed. We're going to find out shortly. It, now, verse 8 is very important. He said, the silver is mine. The gold is mine. What he's trying to say is, all those things you guys are celebrating in the house of Solomon, he said, all of them belong to me. If that's what I actually wanted in this house, I could supply them in quantum for you to actually build with it. But what I actually want to do is more than silver and gold. So he said, the silver is mine, the gold is mine. Go back to verse 7. Verse six, he said, I will fill this house. I will fill this house with glory. And it's very important we look at that word, fill. I will fill this house. That's the Hebrew word. I love, I love how it appears here. Male mala. Glory to God. So it, it's like this. Male mala. <laughs> Two words, actually. And it means to furnish. To fully furnish. So it means he's saying, I will furnish this house with my glory. Not with silver. Not with gold. So what you guys are celebrating is Solomon's temple, which is silver and gold. I have more plans for this new temple that I'm about to build. That new temple will be furnished with glory. Are you what I'm talking about here? He now go to verse 9. He now told them, that the glory of this letter house, what does he refer to as the letter house? The house he was, he, he was about to build, and you're going to see it very shortly, shall be greater than that of the former. Now, what else is he referring to? We're going to come to that. But for now, he, talk, he says the glory of this letter house shall be greater than that of the former. So what does he refer to as the former? The temple of Solomon, right? So you observe that all the temples, all the houses, that they have ever built for God had their own glory. Every place they've ever built as the house of God had its own glory. From the time that Moses built the tabernacle, from the time that Jacob, think about that Jacob's vision. A place where angels, Bible said, Jacob woke up trembling. That's Genesis chapter Chapter 28, verse 16. He saw angels ascending and descending. That's not a common sight. That is a glorious sight. He woke up and said, surely the Lord is in this place. This is the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. It was so glorious. So everywhere they have ever said God is, or they thought God was, always had its own glory. So when Haggai was saying the glory of this letter, I shall get another of the former, he was referring to all the temples that have been, because all of them had their glory. So the temple or the place where Jacob thought was the house of God, which is Bethel, was very glorious. If I, it will interest you that by the time Jacob will return to that place in chapter, I think that's chapter, no, we've not read that since we started this study. I think that's chapter 35. I've just been quoting that he returned there, he returned there. And we've not opened that up. So he returned there later in chapter 35. Amen. God said unto him, Arise and go up to Bethel and dwell there. And make an altar unto the Lord. You know, and all of that. That was where he stayed. That was where he actually wrestled with an angel. That was where he had that vision. Where it was there that his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. So it, so it was a glorious place. Are you what I'm talking about? It was a glorious place. It was an altar. It was a meeting place between God and man. And so everywhere you ever find that God's house was found, 
you will find the glory there. In Exodus 29, for instance, and verse 42, we begin to look at the, the tabernacle that Moses built. He said, this shall be a continual bond of throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak there unto thee. Verse 43, and there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. That's what I'm talking about. Continue. And I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office, okay? And I will dwell among them, uh, among children of Israel, and I will be their God, and all of that. So you notice, in that tabernacle of Moses, God told him, go to verse 46, God told him that he will be there. He will be there. He said, they shall know that I am the Lord their God. So, he, every time they come to that tabernacle, for instance, that Holy of Holies, was quite a very glorious sight. A place you don't enter. Do you know, it, it was, they so dreaded the place, that if the high priest wants to enter, they, are, they were to tie something around his waist. You know, right? And you know what that thing was? That thing had a bell. As he enters, the bell is ringing. That, that's to show them that he's still alive. That he has not died yet. Because should he ever die in there, you cannot go in there to bring him out. They don't burn you well. You have to drag him out. I agree what I'm saying. It was in that Holy of Holies that Zachariah stood and Angel Gabriel appeared to him and told him, you are going to have a son called John the Baptist. It was a glorious place to be. So every place you ever called the house of God was a glorious sight. They were, you always find amazing, glorious, supernatural things happening around that place. So when Haggai was talking about the glory of the former, he knew what he was saying. And you take it down to the temple of Solomon. That one was amazing. And we're going to look at that much later. That one was supernatural. By the time the guy offered a thousand bonds of it, the glory of God came down like a cloud, tangibly. So much so that people could not actually, the priest could not actually stand in that place. And what I'm telling you is not just what can happen in the Bible days. It's what can happen in our day. And what we will see. You know, if you read this, I don't know why God is asking me to make this declaration now. If you read Brother Hagin's book, you know, if you read Brother Hagin, you will read a lot about how that at 17, he was healed. Remember? He actually died. Was, uh, he got it a near-death experience. And he was raised from the dead. And he heard God tell him to go back, you know, and all of that. And then he got up and called his mother and said, Mom, I'm not going to die. You know all those stories that he told. But, you know, he said the first time, because when that thing happened to him, he didn't tell that story. Till after like 15 years or so, he said God did not permit him to share that experience with anybody. I get what I'm saying. Because there are things that will happen to you that God will just tell you to keep to yourself. There are things God will show you that you are not permitted to say. Even in your study. That's what I will tell you, this matter I'm not going to talk about, I'm not going to teach you about, no matter what you do, like start crying. I get the point. So God didn't let him talk about that. He said the first day he shared that story on radio, when he was preaching, he said his mother, his, you know, his grandmother or so, heard the story. And when he met him, he was like, I've not really heard this story from you before. He said, yes, because God didn't let me talk about it. And he, she told him, he said, you shared that story like it was something that happened in a few seconds. And he said, yes. And the mother said, well, that's, the grandmother said, that's not exactly what happened. Because I'll tell you all, our own story from our own physical point of view. He said, one of the sisters ran to call the mother and the grandmother. Ken is dying. Ken is dying in the room. He said, the mother ran into the door. Told her to go into the door. That, as it was after the experience, what I'm trying to show you, the entire room was covered with a cloud. As the mother was running, the thing threw her out. She tried again. The grandmother had run in. By the time the experience finished, the grandmother was just holding on to the doorpost. The mother was lying on the floor. And I was saying, can you see, Ken? And gradually the cloud began to lift. 
I what I'm saying. They clap back. He said, he said, he said actually, that experience happened, took like 10 to 15 minutes in the physical. So that is glory of God. Say amen. amen. So they tried to run in, the thing just dropped her. So he said, when the whole cloud down lifted, the grandmother was one saying, I can now see Ken. The cloud is lifting, it's lifting. I can now see him lying down. And, but she was already so weak, holding onto the doorpost, so she couldn't go in. So she just told the mother, you go in. I think we can go in now. And then she came into the place. That was when Brother Hagin was not telling her, I'm not going to die. So actually, there is such a thing as the glory of God. Are you following what I'm talking about, friends? So when the Bible was saying that in the, in, the, in the temple of Solomon, that the glory filled up the place. Even the priest couldn't stand to minister. That's why when we have meetings and people go down under the power, don't say, where can you find that in the Bible? There was a time the glory came in the Bible, the priest could not stand there to minister. Are you feel I'm talking about, friends? Could not stand there to minister. And all those temples had their glory. So Solomon, Solomon's temple was quite a glorious sight to behold. Aside the silver and the gold, right? It was a place, it was filled tangibly with the glory of God. That's 2 Chronicles chapter 5, 2 Chronicles 5. Glory filled up everywhere. The priest couldn't stand, they couldn't minister. So it's either you run out or maybe you lie down. And if you can't stand, it was such a sight to behold. So I'm trying to show you that every temple, every tabernacle, every house that had ever attempted to build was filled with the glory. Tangible expressions. I used to hear. Was filled with the glory. I quoted 2 Chronicles chapter 5. And that's taking forever to come on the screen. Glory to God. So that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. The glory of the Lord filled the house of God. So there was nowhere. Remember where we are coming from in this study. Remember that Stephen told them in Acts chapter 7. That the Almighty did not live in those houses they built. Do you remember that? But even though he didn't live in those buildings, there was tangible glory. Amen. You now go to go back to Haggai 2, verse 8, verse 9. Haggai 2, verse 9. The glory of this letter house, God was telling them. This letter house. Actually, he's talking about the final house. We're going to see shortly shall be greater than of the former. Greater than of the former, said the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will, will I give peace? The Lord of hosts said, there is a letter house. The letter house. The glory of that letter house will be greater. One translation that captured this beautifully and will save me a lot of explanation this evening is Amplify Classic. The letter glory of this house with its successor to which Jesus came so the house was referring to was not just that thing they were building. You get the point? The later glory of this house, with its successor to which Jesus came, shall be greater than that than the former, said the Lord. So the glory was referring to, or the temple was referring to, was actually Christ and the temple that he was going to build, which happens to be you and I. Are you following me? So the glory of this temple that God has built, because we are the temple of God now. He's saying it shall be greater than the former. So we are God's temple. And what Haggai is actually trying to say is that you as God's temple, you have much more glory than whatever that Solomon had in his temple. You have much more glory than whatever Moses had in tabernacle. Because that tabernacle, that temple, was only a sign. You are the real temple that carries the full glory. And this is such an amazing thing to see. So, by the time you now read Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 1, he said, Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord 
Glory to God. King James, please. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Arise, shine, for thy light has come. The glory of God is risen upon thee. Verse 2. Verse 2. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth. Gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall rise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon you. This is a prophecy about the New Testament. A prophecy about you in the New Testament. That upon you and in you shall the glory of God be seen. So that glory that they went to see in the temple, he's now saying that glory shall be risen upon thee. People shall see that glory in your life now. Because you are now, the, you are now God's temple. That's what I'm talking about. Go to verse 1. Proverbs 5 classic. Oh, hallelujah. Arise from the depression and prostration in which circumstances have kept you. Rise to a new life. Shine. Be radiant with the glory of the Lord. For your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Verse 2. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth. And dense darkness all peoples. But the Lord shall arise upon you, Jerusalem. His glory shall be seen on you. This is talking about me. So I am so the new creation man is meant to be a dispenser, a carrier, and a dispenser of God's glory. So it's supposed to be that when people are looking for the glory of the Lord, they come to you because you are now the house of God, housing his very glory. To which her guy said, That glory shall be greater than the former temples that have been built. Are you following what I'm talking about? And this is so important this evening. Because like I said, we're going to get into a journey. Maybe from tomorrow. We're going to get on a journey where we're going to address a few things about spiritual things. But you must understand that there is the glory of God upon your life. You know, I've seen teachings on five steps to carry the glory. And I want to say again and again, there's nothing like that. You are God's temple. The glory of this letter house shall be greater than the former. So there is a glory that this letter house has. And in Isaiah 60, he didn't say you should try your best for the glory of God to come upon you. He said his glory shall be seen on you. It shall be seen. It's not about what you try to do. It's something, it's the furnishing of the house. Just like when you're done building a house, you begin to furnish the house. When God was done building new creation, man, he furnished this house. The furnishing is the glory of God. So we don't do things like, you know, 15 steps to carry the glory. No. People that teach those things, that is something they are trying to say. And I will not say that totally ignorant. But then things should be communicated properly. Amen. We carry God's glory. And I'm going to show you many times in the Bible, though. For instance, in John 17, I think we'll see that one be rounding up. I think verse 22, Jesus said, The glory that thou givest me have I given them. The glory which thou givest me, I've given them. So the temple of God, in God's temple, there is glory. Do you get the point? In Bethel, there was glory. In Moses' tabernacle, there was glory. In Solomon's temple, there was glory. In this letter house, there is glory. A greater glory. Are you still here? A greater glory. Let me, let me do a little explanation here. What do we mean by the glory of God? What do we mean by the glory of God? When we mean the glory shall be seen in you, what do we mean by that? By the time I explain to you what the glory of God actually means, you will understand why I said that you can, no believer, no house of God does not have his glory. And I've explained this in a couple of teachings, but I'm just going to do it again. So it comes fresh. Is that okay? So what is the glory of God? Look at something. Exodus 33 verse 18. What is the glory of God? What is the glory of God? And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. I was teaching this last year's so old. So Moses said to God, show me your glory. And I tell you what, every time I read this scripture, I pause to think and think. Even yesterday while I was going over it, I was just meditating over it. Let me tell you briefly about a man called Moses. 
The man called Moses, when he got, the, when the first training God gave him on the supernatural, was to tell him to, was to show him a burning bush. A bush that was burning, but the fire was not burnt. Are you here? Imagine the sight. Then in the process, God told him, drop your rod. He dropped it, it turned to snake. Pick it up, it turned to rod again. He went into the Egyptian camp. He went into Egypt. And he did a lot of amazing things. He touched Nile. Nile turned to blood. He struck the earth. Lies took over everywhere. I get to the point. When they were pushed, when they were, he was leading Israel out of Egypt, they got to Red Sea. He struck Red Sea. Red Sea divided and formed a wall. Formed walls. And still like that, I've told you for days. So how do you know it's for, it was for days? You know, when you read that story, it looks like it just happened and they passed. You know how many people that were passing? Think of over 600,000 to 1 million people that left Egypt. How long will it take them to finish crossing? It? And think Red Sea is from here to there. Red Sea. Have you seen a sea before? You possibly have not. Because that's the problem. When you hear Red Sea, you're thinking of stream. Thinking of a village stream. I get to the point. Red Sea like that. So they were passing for days. While that was happening, a cloud, a pillar of cloud appeared behind them and stood there to stop the Egyptians from coming to them. The pillar stood there. At night, it would turn to fire. In the day, it would turn to cloud. That was the man Moses. Are you following the point? That man went up to the mountain and got commandments from God. The Israelites will watch him enter the mountain, literally. Enter. They will, they will watch a cloud cover him. That was the man Moses. He was the man to whom God said, or of whom God said, if I have a prophet, I speak to him in dreams and visions. But to my servant Moses, I speak to him face to face. That was the man Moses. I guess what I'm talking about here. He was the man that prayed and manna came down from heaven. Physical food dropped. He spoke to rock. Rock began to give water. He struck rock. That was the man Moses. That man now came to Exodus 33 after he had seen all of this and he told God, show me your glory. What else was Moses looking for? That already begins to show you that the glory of God is beyond signs. Are you following what I'm saying? What is the glory? We want to find it. Was he asking for more power? More demonstrations? Some of the things that Moses did in his own days, even some Christians will never do it till they die. Uh, possibly because there will be no need for that. Because I don't know why you need to divide Red Sea. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So you may not need to divide Red Sea. Are you following me? And you may not need to, what else? Get water from rock. Glory to God. But the man was anointed like that. The man had results. Moses spoke. The earth opened and swallowed human beings. That you should be afraid of Moses. You know when I saw people just talk carelessly about Moses, me, I'm afraid. Say, so Moses didn't know the word. He said, don't just be careful. <laughs> the last two people that the last people that spoke against Moses, I don't know how their life became. Go and ask Korah and his friends. Go and ask Miriam. The man had supernatural happenings around him. Some of the things that we can call or see power, see glory. The man had all of this, all of this. He said, Father, show me your glory. Because there was something Moses understood. And we're going to see what Moses understood. Now, what was God's answer when he prayed that prayer? Huh? Glory to God. If I probably get to this, to this verse 18, because I just want to show you what I'm saying. Go to verse 7. Where was Moses when he was saying this he was saying? Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, far off from the camp, and called the tabernacle of the congregation. And they came by that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of congregation, which was without the camp. 
And it came to pass when Moses went out to the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door. So watch this. The man will enter the tabernacle. All of them will stand at their tent door and looked after Moses until he was going to the tabernacle. Verse 9. And it came to pass as Moses entered the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses. Moses was a mysterious man. All of them will just stand at their door watching him. They will enter the tabernacle. Glory, the cloud will cover the place. It was inside that cloud that he asked God, show me your glory. Like inside that tabernacle, cloud covering him. Inside there, he said, Lord, show me your glory. So what was he asking about? It wasn't about signs. Amen. Are you still here? Look at that. The Lord talked to Moses in verse 10. Come on, verse 10. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle. And all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. In their, they don't come close in their door. Just stand at their door and worship. Because they dare not come close. So you can just go on and on. So in verse 18, he asked the Lord, show me your glory. The interesting thing is the answer that the Lord gave him. But before we look at that answer, you observe that Moses had seen cloud, was even inside a cloud. You know last year thing, the glory cloud, right? I was doing, I was doing it on the first day. He was even inside a cloud. And yet inside that cloud, he said, show me your glory. Because he understood that the glory of God was beyond cloud. So most of these things to celebrate today, Moses saw them and still said, Father, I want to see your glory. Amen. So what look at God's answer to him in verse 19. Read it to everybody. Talk, 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 talk. Come on, start again. And he said, And I will show mercy. Verse 20. And he said, Thou cannot see my face. For there shall no man see me. So Moses asked for the glory of God. God said, nobody can see my face. So he knew that what Moses was asking about was not just about supernatural or whatever. He wanted to see the face of God. And it doesn't mean he wanted to see how God looked. Well, you will get to it eventually. So he wanted to see the face of God. To see the face of God. Are you still here? So before we proceed, he understood that the glory of God was not a thing. It was not a cloud. It was not manifestation. It was beyond that. It was not whatever. It was not gold. It was not money. It was not ambience. And it's a good place to talk about some of these things as we begin to close. And when we'll be, we'll be closing rather, not now. Because sometimes people will just see a man of God just coming with a very fine car, fine suit, with a very expensive shoe. He said, Kai, it's good to serve God though. See glory. Where is the glory? I got what I'm saying. By the time we set up all the lights here, the choir is singing, the lights are moving, and you know that smoky. You know that thing? The smoke everywhere is just say, oh, glory, glory. <laughs> that is not the glory. Amen. Later in this series, I'm going to move to talk about the glory of God in the church. We are getting there. What happened to the glory? Moses had the real thing. He didn't have any smoky and he didn't have fancy light. Real cloud. Now you create cloud. You know, we, you know that smoky effect? Uh, we create smoke effect. Moses did not create his own. Every time, he, and it's not like Moses would come out and tell them. You know, the thing was so tangible. And whenever, whenever Moses comes out of that tabernacle, his face will be cloudy. The Israelites could not look at him. The, the, the thing will still be on his face. So why is this man asking God to show him his glory? Are you following what I'm saying? It was so much that he would use a cloth to cover it. He will veil that face. So at least he can talk with them. They couldn't come close. And I've had that kind of experience actually. Finish fasting and pray one time. People couldn't look at my face. Like you look at my face, not in the spirit, but in the spirit, you see the trap fire. 
a trap. Are you what I'm saying? Yes. But that is not the glory. <laughs> Are you what I'm talking about here? That's not the glory. That's not the glory. But there's something that is, I'm going to show you today. But that thing is not the glory. So God said to him, you cannot see my face and live. So actually, what Moses was requesting was to see the face of God. Amen. Now, we're going to come back to Moses. What does God mean by, you cannot see my face? We're going to come back to this. Much later, just very soon now. Is that okay? But let's go to Isaiah chapter 40. We're on a journey. What is the glory of God? Please keep it somewhere that what Moses asked for was to see the face of God. So we can almost tell you that, I can almost, I can already tell you that what Moses meant by let me see your glory was let me see your face. So if we find out what exactly he meant by the face of God or what God meant by his face, we we'll would have found out what the glory of God is. Are you still here? Isaiah 40 verse 1. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, said your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she had received of the Lord's son double for all her sins. The voice of him that cried in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight. And the rough place is plain. Go back to verse 3. Read to me everybody verse 3. Who is this person carrying the wilderness? Huh? This is not simple Bible knowledge. John the Baptist. Because when he came, he told them, I am the voice of him that carried the wilderness. So verse 3 and verse 4 actually was talking about the ministry of John the Baptist. Is that, is that clear? Is that, is that clear? The voice of John that cried in the wilderness, is that okay? Prepare the word of the Lord, make sure in the desert a highway for our God. Verse 4, every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the clear path shall be made straight, and the rough place is plain. See verse 5, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. So after John is done crying in the wilderness, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. What do you think he's talking about here? What was the glory that was revealed after John cried that all flesh, not believers, all flesh saw together? He's talking about Christ. But if I say that too, we're going to say, don't worry, we'll continue. I flow in points. So, John spoke about the glory in verse 5. Isaiah said, when that happens, all flesh shall see it. Put up Amplified Classic. Mm. And the glory majesty, splendor of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So the glory of God, the majesty, the splendor of God shall be revealed after a voice cries in the wilderness. After joy, John speaks, all flesh shall see that glory together. Now go to verse 6. Go to verse 6. The voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. Gr the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Pay attention now. O Zion that bringeth forth good tidings, dig thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem that bringeth forth good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift up, be not afraid. Okay, say unto the cities of Judah, what shall you say unto the cities of Judah? Behold, your God. So that glory that shall be revealed, okay, as I said, we are going to say to Judah, behold your God. So it was God revealed in their midst that all flesh saw. That is what we meant by the glory of God. So when he was saying all flesh shall see the glory, he was referring to Jesus as that glory that all flesh shall see. That is not confusing. If it is, I'll take you to the New Testament. So I'm trying to show you that Jesus is actually the glory of God. The glory of God is not a thing, it's a person. Go to verse 10. Behold, the Lord will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. 
Behold, his reward is with him, and his walk before him. Verse 11. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom. And shall surely lead those that are with young. Who is he talking about here? He's talking about Jesus. As God's shepherd that will lead the people. Are you feel what I'm saying now? So when he was saying that all flesh shall see his glory in verse 5, he was actually talking about how God will be revealed in the flesh. Now that's why you now read, you now read um, John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word. Read with me. The word was with God. And the word. So who is this word? Who is the word? Talk, talk. Who is the word? In the beginning was, the word was, the word was, so who is this word? Is God. And this is he talking about Jesus? This is about Christ. Go to verse, I wanted to do that, I wanted to do that everything, but go to verse 14. Bear in mind, the word is Christ. Verse 14, read with me. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace. So who is the word that was made flesh? Huh? Talk to me. Who? Who? So who did we behold his glory? Christ. Does it relate to what Isaiah said in Isaiah 40 that all flesh shall see his glory? So when Isaiah was saying all flesh shall see his glory, he was trying to say that Jesus was going to come in the flesh and everybody will see him. Are you following what I'm saying now? So when you hear all flesh shall see his glory, He's not saying all flesh shall see a cloud. John breaks it down to tell us that when the word came, we beheld that glory. So the prophet of Isaiah was fulfilled in verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus is that glory of God that we beheld. That's why you now read Hebrew 1. Verse 1. He said, God who has sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in time, in time past unto the fathers by the prophet, has in this last day spoken to us, pay attention now, by his son, whom he had appointed her of all things, by whom also he made the walls. Read verse 3 with me, everybody. Who being what? The brightness. So who is the brightness of God's glory? The son. Put up energy of this verse. Read everybody. The son radiates God's own glory. Put up amplified classic. He is the sole expression of the glory of God. The light being, the outrain or radiance of the divine. So Jesus is the, is the glory of God. And so when God said to Moses, are you going to see this now? You shall not see, no man can see my face and live. Because he was trying to say what you are asking for. Moses, you are no longer asking for power. You are not asking for a cloud. You are now asking to see my face. And who is that face of God? You get the point? So how is Jesus the face of God? In whom is the character of God revealed? Christ. In whom do we see the fullness of God? Christ. In whom is the beauty of God revealed? Christ. Jesus told them in John 14 verse 9, he said, if you see me, you have seen the Father. So God is faceless. Jesus is his face. Let me tell you who Jesus is. Jesus is actually the 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 invisible God made visible. So God who had no face wore a face in the, in the person of Jesus. Now this will get clear. I just follow. So when Moses said, I want to see your glory. God said, well, you're asking to see my face. You're asking to see my true character. He said, you cannot see it now and leave. Why did he say that? Well, it wasn't yet time for that to be revealed. Now, follow what I'm going to show you. He now told Moses, go to chapter 34 of Exodus. He now told Moses, I'm going to make my, I'm going to show you my, my back. Are you following? All this is figurative. I'm going to show you what? What did Moses ask to see? His face. What did God say he will show him? What, what does that mean? You cannot have the full revelation of all these things yet because the face has not yet been revealed. That face will be revealed in Christ Jesus. But let us see, what is the, the God show Moses his back? Did he show him his back? Did he? Talk to me, you know Bible. Did he show me his back? Huh? 
Bible said it should be his back now. So what was, what was the back? What was the color of God's back? Huh? Now, by now you are beginning to say what Moses was asking for was not a sight. It was not an experience. What God showed him his back. How did God show Moses his back? Exodus 34. Watch this. Exodus 34. Um, verse 5. <laughs> Okay, start from verse 1. Everybody please watch this. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone, like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that we are in the first tables which thou breakest. And be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning unto Sinai, and praise thyself there, all of that, verse 3. And no man shall come up with thee, verse 4. And he, hewed, he did what God told him, verse 5. It, and the Lord descended in the cloud, and stood with him there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. So how did God show Moses his back? He proclaimed his name. See the next verse. And he, the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. Verse 7, keep him mercy for a thousand. So what is the back of God that Moses saw? A revelation of the character of God. I know what I'm saying. So when Moses was saying, God, show me your face, he wasn't asking to see, because he had seen everything. He was saying, I just want to understand you better. I want to know your real character. And God said, well, you cannot see it now, but I will show you my back. See what is in my back. The Lord, mercy for keeping mercy for a thousand, forgiving iniquity and transgression. Do you understand what I'm talking about here? Uh -huh. See the next verse, verse 8. And Moses made his and bowed his head and worshipped, uh, on the, bowed, the, bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. Verse 9. And he said, if I have now found grace in thy eyes, O Lord, let my, oh Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us. For it is a sickness people. You know, hey, Moses was a very wise person. You know, he said, God, please go with us. You know why? All the while they were walking in the wilderness, they were walking with an angel. So all those miracles were angelic, whatever. So they said, Lord, will you go with us? Let's leave this matter. But you know what I'm going to say now? Uh -huh. So it was the back of God. So when God showed Moses his back, he didn't see a big back or a fine back or a curvy back. What did he see? The Lord plenty in mercy, the Lord gracious, the Lord merciful. So Moses was actually saying, I want to see your face. I want to see your glory. I want to see what you really are like. I've seen miracles. I've seen this in the Bible, but I want to see what you really look like. And God is saying, not yet. So when Jesus now came, the face of God was revealed. So who is the glory of God that Moses was asking to see? He was asking to see Jesus in his fullness. So John now tells us that when the word became flesh, we beheld his glory. So when we now say that we are the house of God, who lives in us? Christ lives in us. So who is the glory of God? Christ is the glory of God. So when the Bible says the glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former, he's actually trying to say that latter house shall have the real glory of God and not just experiences. Are you following what I'm talking about, everybody? Not just cloud, not just power, not just fire fall, but the real glory will not live in them. So every believer houses the glory of God because Jesus is the glory of God. And he lives in us as the glory of God. Are you following this? Are you following to this point? And so, you notice, okay, his glory is a person. So, Jesus is that glory. So, go back to that Hebrew 1 verse 3 again. With New Living Translation or any other one. The sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. So when you talk about the glory of God, before you talk of, think of cloud and fire, think of a person. Think of Jesus himself. The word became flesh and we beheld his glory. It was in Jesus that the glory of God was fully made manifest. They have seen fire, they have seen cloud, they have seen red sea divide, they have seen cripple walk, they have seen blind eyes see, but they had never seen the glory. I feel like I'm talking about friends that never seen the glory. 
And Isaiah prophesied and said to them, a time is going to come that that you guys have not seen, all flesh will be able to see. That must have been a strange prophecy to Israel. Because even the one in the Holy of Holies, only the high priest enters there. Are you going to talk about? The one in Moses' tabernacle, only Moses will go in to see. The one in the temple, the priest could not stand. And as I say, the time is going to come that all flesh shall see that glory. That's why, you know, sometimes as I read the Old Testament, I say, some of these prophets of God, we are bold men. Come on. They were saying crazy things. Forget that it has happened. Something that nobody could see normally. As I said, one day, all flesh. That is sinner, unbeliever, pagan, Hindu, Buddha. Everybody will see the glory physically. They say you are mad. It was that same Isaiah that woke up one day and said, a virgin shall conceive and be with a child. That's to tell you sometimes in the prophetic that you say something and it doesn't happen, it has not happened yet. You're not stop from saying another one. The man finished saying a virgin shall conceive with a child. Now no virgin, virgin conceived, he lived and died. You can imagine those guys reading Isaiah's at, uh, documents. There was one madman that once lived. He said a virgin shall conceive and be a child. That guy said a lot of crazy things. No virgin conceived. No virgin. One, it was even unthinkable to say a virgin would be a child. I get to the point. But he was saying it. He's now telling that I wonder that all flesh shall stand and see the glory of God. And he was saying it with confidence. Problem is that he would say it and write it. Because he really believed what he was saying. Do you know that all Isaiah's prophecy in the book of Isaiah, not one happened in his lifetime. We're going to get, tomorrow or next, I'm going to teach you about the prophetic ministry. Amen? Amen. Because he's still under this whole stuff. Not one of them happened. Not one happened in his lifetime. Not one. All the things he said. Go and read Isaiah. A virgin shall be a child. Shall be called Emmanuel. He even named his own child Emmanuel. He lived and died. Even Jeremiah and the rest. It was thousands of years, or hundreds of years rather, after Jeremiah had died, that Daniel discovered Jeremiah's book and found out that we should have been set from captivity. So all those things he said did not happen in his time. But they were just bold to speak and write. That's one of the ways to actually function in the supernatural. One of the things you need is to be very bold. And to be very confident that God is speaking to you. A prophet that needs people's validation to know that God is speaking to him, we miss God. Because some people, how they know that God is speaking to them, God is speaking? Your name is this, Chiamaka. He said, yes, sir. What if you say your name is Chiamaka? The person says no. Will you see me confident and say that God is talking to you? These guys who are giving prophetic words that we are not happening. At least at the time. But they were speaking. Isaiah wrote up to 60 something page, ch chapters. Saying that same thing that was not happening. But now, not one has failed. I get the point. And he was saying unthinkable, unreasonable things. A virgin shall conceive and be with a child. That is the one that I don't know. That what gave him the guts to say that? I'm just saying it. He was bruised for our transgression. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes, we are healed. Just talking. And I'm sure, I'm almost sure that every time they come out from that realm, they, they, even the they begin to wonder what they said. You get the point? So how do you know that that was happening? First Peter tells us that they were searching what manner of time the spirit of Christ in them was testifying about. They were wondering, what are all these nonsense you are saying? And he said, God told them that what they were saying was not for them. First Peter 1, 10 to 12. Of which salvation the prophet spirit of... Okay, stay with NLT. This salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this great salvation. So they, so they were prophesying about the salvation, but they, were want, they wanted to know about it. So they were saying things they didn't understand. But they were prophesying, Sha. Some of you that will be calling to stand in the prophetic office, this is one training that you actually need. But there are things that you will say that will not happen in your day. Amen. Amen. A prophet can be made a liar before everybody, yet he's speaking the truth. 
can make a liar before the whole church. Before the whole country, yet he's saying the truth. I don't know why God is saying he's bringing this digression very strongly. You get the point? Yet he's speaking the truth. Look at verse, verse 11. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ in them, within them was talking about. So they were saying this and are wondering, what the, what the hell are we saying? One, what time, when is this going to happen? Two, what's it, what is God? What, is, what are we even saying? Because God was telling them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory after. So they were saying they didn't understand. Look at God's answer to them in verse 12. They were told that their messages were not for themselves but for you. So God told them, just be saying it. It's not for, it's not, you don't need it. But be saying it. Are you still here? Are you getting blessed? So Isaiah was just prophesying. He said, the time is going to come. That glory that all of you are not able to see. All flesh will see. He looked stupid, but eventually it happened. When Jesus came to the earth, everybody saw him. The haters, the pagans, everybody saw him. Just they didn't know that it was Isaiah's prophecy being fulfilled. That it, really, re realistically, all flesh has now seen the glory of God. Now that glory of God that all flesh has seen has now come to tabernacle inside of you. So the believer is a carrier of the glory of God. Not just because he speaks in tongues or he interprets tongues, but because Jesus lives in him. Because all those clouds that came to the testament, the reality of them is that Christ has come. So I carry the glory of God. Yeah, don't worry, sit, sit, sit. I just want to teach a little more. So you carry the glory. So the glory of God is not just fire. It's not wind. It's not cloud. It's a person. It is Jesus. That Jesus now lives in you. So, when Moses said, I want to see your face, he was actually saying, I want to see your true character. That face of God has been revealed in Christ. In Christ Jesus, we see what God looks like. We see God's personality. Think about this. Fire did not reveal the, the character of God. Cloud did not reveal it. All those things, the miracles did not reveal it fully. But in Jesus, we see the full character of God. John 14, 9. If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So, Jesus is the Father revealed. So, look at the secret to what I'm trying to show you. Why I call Jesus the face of God. Has anyone ever seen God? No. And yes. The Paul calls it this way. He says, says it this way. He said, the great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. He's talking about Jesus. So, it was in the person of Jesus that God, for the first time, came in the flesh. So, there has been no revelation of God. No other incarnation before Jesus. I mean, God has never appeared in the human form before. Please, I want to make, say this for a reason. Because when I read the Old Testament, there's the way things you are rendered, you might get confused. God has never appeared in a human form before Jesus. You know, the Bible tells us in the book of Genesis that um, Abraham was in his house and God came with two other people, and God ate in his ass. You know that story? Do you know the story? When God was doing, God destroyed Sodom. God came. No. The only incarnation, the only time God has ever come out in the flesh is in the person of Jesus. Are you still here? So God was manifest in the flesh. Only happened in Christ Jesus. So nobody has ever seen God. So even Moses, with everything he saw, so never saw God, never saw the glory of God. He never saw the face of God. He just saw his back. Now, we have seen God face to face. Now, the real glory, the real person of God has now come to live in us. So, you now understand, go back to Haggai chapter 2 verse 9. The glory of this letter house would now mean the person of Jesus. You get the point? So we're talking about the glory of the letter house. What we are talking about is Jesus revealed. So how many of us are full of glory here? You are. Not because 
you, you know, you, you speak in tongues, as important as that is, not because you've raised the dead, but because Jesus himself lives in you. Now, this is very important. So, Christ knows the glory of God. That's why you now understand Isaiah 60 and verse 2. When he's, verse 1 says, Arise and shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, that shall you cover the earth, gross darkness the people, but the glory of, Lord, of but the Lord shall rise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. So, the question is, where do we see Jesus today? In the believer. So, when he says, the glory shall be seen upon thee, he's trying to say, Jesus will be seen in you. So you see what we've been teaching all the while? You don't find Jesus in an object. You don't find him in an oil. You find him in the sense. So the glory of God is not, none other place than in the believers. So I carry the glory of God as you see me here now. I house God's glory. This is the tabernacle of the glory of God. And I'm not talking about a thing or a cloud or fire. I'm talking about a person. The person of Jesus. Are you still here? Are you still here? Now, let's track back a little. Let me show you something. You observe. Now, I've just shown you what the real glory is. Right? But did you observe, like I showed you, that wherever this glory was revealed, there will be a supernatural happiness. Right? So, what the believer now has to do is to go around the world revealing the glory. Manifesting his glory. Showing forth his glory. Now, in that showing forth, there will now be supernatural happenings. The supernatural happenings are not the glory, but they are a manifestation of the glory. Let me show you that. John 2, verse 11. John 2, verse 11. Let's see together, everybody. Are you guys sleeping? Let's read together. The Jesus in Cana of Galilee and so Jesus manifested forth his glory. How did he do that? He walked miracle. What miracle was talking about here? He turned water into wine. So miracles are not the glory. But whenever the glory is and is manifested, miracles will happen. Tongues is not the glory. But where the glory is manifested, tongues will show. Red Sea dividing might not be the glory. But whenever that glory is manifested, Red Seas will divide. So when I'm saying that all of these are not the glory of God, I'm not talking down on them. I'm only saying they are not the real thing. So look at the thing here. Whether you've spoken in tongues or not, whether you've raised the dead or not, whether you've opened blind eyes or not, you house the glory of God. But then, because you have you house the glory of God, you should now raise the dead. You should now speak in tongues. You should now open blind eyes. Because wherever the glory is revealed, signs will follow. Every time God's glory has ever been revealed, signs must be seen. Every time. So, what I'm trying to say, what I was talking about from tomorrow, is that because you carry Jesus, the real glory of God, we should expect manifestations from you. Things that can be seen and things that can be heard. Sights and sounds of the Spirit. So, you see, there is no teaching for the believer. There should be no teaching for the believer on how to carry the glory of God. There's no teaching like that. But there should be a teaching on how to manifest and show forth that glory. Because we already carry the glory of God. Just that many of us don't know that it is time to begin to manifest and reveal. So Jesus did miracles and the Bible recorded these miracles as his glory manifested. Put up like an NLT of this. The, this miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory. So, they called miracles a revelation of the glory. Do you, do you understand how the Bible writes? He didn't call miracles the glory of God. He said that miracle was a revelation of the glory of God. So, if the real glory of God is inside of you, then you should reveal it. Or can I say you should reveal him? 
And the first time Jesus ever revealed that glory, what happened? Water turned to wine. I'm going to train us in the next few days on how you can be a man that manifests, reveals, dispenses the glory of God wherever you go. Because indeed you carry that glory inside of you. Just that many of us don't know how to dispense, how to manifest this thing. Every time that glory was revealed in the testament, there were manifestations. Sights and sounds. You, what, I, what do you mean by sights and sounds? Every time that glory was manifested, people saw things and they heard things. Every time. That they saw a brand man, walk, walk, man walking, or they saw a cloud, or they saw fire, or they, they always see things. Every time. That's why a believer who is not demonstrating signs and wonders has not yet learned how to show forth this thing. And he is living short of who he is as the oikos of God. God's house carries God's glory and must manifest God's glory. So you are not just living short of who you are in Christ because you lied or you fornicated. You are also living short of who you are in Christ if you cannot open blind eyes. Because you are the house of God carrying his glory. Is someone following me this evening? No. Yes, say, I house the glory. Yes, say, like you may say, I house God's glory. Yes, so you are not, I want to say it again. It's not only when you lie or when you sin that you are living short of who God has made you. When you are not releasing that glory, when you are not manifesting, showing forth. That power, you are actually falling, you are living short of who God has made you. Because God filled you with his glory that you can reveal that glory to all, to everyone on earth. So, put up like Amplified Classic. Reveal the glory. He said, this, the first of his signs, miracles, wonder works, Jesus performed the kind of Galilee, Galilee and manifested his glory. By it, he displayed his greatness and his power openly. So the glory of God lives in us. God is calling us to display that glory for the world to see. And from tomorrow, I'll begin to minister to hungry people actually. Now, hungry in this context is not hunger to possess. People say, Lord, I want more of God. Mm -mm. Don't pray that prayer. You cannot have more of God. You are complete in him. Don't talk about hunger. But you know what I'm saying? I'm not saying hunger. You know, I've, I've, there are many stories. People, many songs people sing these days. If I begin to talk about what I think about songs, people sing. You guys will say I'm a critic. So let me leave it. But all this, give me, give me this, fill me, put inside of me. All those ones are not entirely very correct. You are complete in him. What the hunger in you should be should be to show forth this thing that you carry to the world. So when a believer is spending time in prayer, he should not be spending time in prayer because he wants to carry the, the, the glory of God. He is already carrying the glory of God. He should be spending time in prayer so he can express it. The Bible tells us the earnest, heartfelt, consumed prayer for a righteous man, that's James, Amplified Classic, makes tremendous power available. So it's prayer that makes power available. The question is, where, now watch this, prayer makes power available, right? Are you here? Dynamic. What kind of power does it make available? Tremendous power. But this power that it makes available, what does it mean by it makes it available? Is it that when we begin to pray, God will throw down power from above? No, sir. Ephesians already told us that it said unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in you. So the power that can do exceeding abundantly above is working in you. Is that correct? So when the Bible now says that when we pray we make power available, where are we making the power available from? From within us. I know what I'm talking about. So, we actually pray 
to make power available, to release whatever from within. We are carrying God's glory. We don't pray to receive. We pray to dispense. And so there must be that hunger and passion in you to see this earth come in contact with the real glory of God. That is Jesus. When he shows up, there is salvation. When he shows up, blind eyes open. When he shows up, there is deliverance. When he shows up, deaf ears open. That's the glory of God. And you house that glory. So when I see a blind man and I open his eyes, what have I done? I've manifested the glory. I feel what I'm saying. Every time he showed up in his incarnation, remember, he is the house of God. He was the house of God in his incarnation. Remember that? Every time he showed up, things happened. Either blind men saw or demon possessed, you are cast out. We are now housing him. It should be the same wherever we go, we come. It should be the same. It should be the same. It should be the same wherever you appear. That's why I want to close today by stirring up a desire in you. I think it's an anomaly for you to actually, actually house something. Something that is a solution to the world problem and yet you cannot release it. And I'm going to stir up that desire that you should want to do more with the glory of God inside of you. You should want to do more with the power of God inside of you. You should want to do more because you carry that glory. You carry that power. You carry that fullness. And there should be a desire in you to do more with it. So, we are supposed to display. Remember what Isaiah said. He said, the glory of the Lord shall be seen in you. So people are meant to see the glory of God in us. And let me say this. We thank God. God, this is how God wants, wants me to close this. I want to say, like I said, if I want to correct very well. The furnishing of the house of God. Remember where we started? He said, I will fill this house with the glory. What, what's the furnishing of the house? The glory. Silver and gold is mine. So the furnishing of this house will not be silver. It will not be gold. What I'm trying to say is this. The furnishing of the believer is not how much he has. The furnishing of the believer is not how many degrees he has. The glory of God is what furnishes, what has furnished the believer. So we don't go around the world showing how much we have. We don't go around the world showing how intelligent we, ha we are. We go around the world displaying the glory of God so that men can be changed. Because money can only cause temporary change. If you dash someone one million naira today, by next month he needs more. So there's nothing wrong with dashing for money. But that's not the major thing. That's why I, I find it terrible for believers to refer to ephemeral things as the glory of God. So you see a pastor wearing suit. You say, ah, see glory. Maybe he bought the suit 400 and something. You know that suit's like that. I saw one suit like that. I wanted to buy. Chatted them up and said, I want this. They said 400 and something. I said, okay. I will get back to you. And for real, I'm going to get back to them. Uh, that's, that's what I said for another day. But you know, when people wear such things, just say, ah, See glory. We must be very careful what we call the glory of God. That we don't begin to exchange gold for brass. That we don't begin to play with just so because somebody is looking fine. He has glory. See, a man of God that does not have a car yet, who comes on a bike, comes for a meeting. We don't take him serious. He doesn't have evidence. Evidence. The one that has big guys, it has evidence. Because we think that's the glory. The foolishness of this house is the glory. When the glory is revealed, we are talking about signs. We are talking about salvation. We are talking about miracles. We are talking about blindness opening. We are talking about casting out of devils. And that's why many of us are pursuing, for, pursuing things that don't matter. 
Look at how much energy you are putting in in trying to make money. Look at how much energy. There is nothing wrong with that. But I hope that same energy will go in in trying to show forth the true thing that God has filled you up with. Because a rich man who cannot cast out devils is broke. I should be pitied. A rich believer who cannot express the glory of God, who cannot manifest the glory of God, should not be envied. Should not be envied. And that's one thing I like a lot about this church. You never get to be celebrated here because you are rich. No. That is not, we say we love you when you give. But that is not actually what makes us who we are. We are full of God's glory. We must display that glory for the world to see. Philip entered Samaria with it. You know, because of this thing I'm telling you, many of you are pursuing money and things. It's okay, oh. but you know, that's not the real thing that God has filled you with. The real furnishing that God has given you is that he has filled you with his glory. So if not, why will Philip, a common, spare me, let me use that word, a common food sharer in church stand before the Ethiopian eunuch. You've told you about him, right? The then CPN in their time, the then manager of the treasury of the queen of Ethiopia. Very wealthy man. Philip, he met Philip and said, please help me. And Philip taught him and baptized him. Yes. Because it's not about money. Are you going to talk about friends? It's not about money. It's not about money. Peter, an ordinary fisherman. Just a fisherman. Who was even bad in business. Because the two times we read in the Bible that Peter went fishing, he didn't catch nothing until Jesus came. The first time I was before he met Jesus, he was broke. Jesus made him catch fish. After Jesus rose from the died, he went back to fish. He still caught nothing. So I don't know how successful he was as a fisherman. Just saying. <laughs> Glory to God. All the time he ever attempted to fish, he didn't catch nothing. I don't know why God is saying I should say this. I said it now. I said it again. He caught nothing. Yet that man was sent to the house of Cornelius, a centurion. Someone you could call a general in his time. And Cornelius saw Peter and bowed before him. That glory. He was housing it. And that's why because you've had one or two failures here and there in your life. Does not mean that it cannot be something for God. It doesn't mean God cannot reveal himself through you. Because Peter was not, a, was not so successful a fisherman. Two times he went fishing, he would toil all night and catch nothing. Because, you know, there's this movie that the actor, I'm not banking on the movie, I'm just telling you a story. This um, series, The Chosen, have you seen it? About the life of Jesus. They depicted Peter as a very broke fisherman who was not, <laughs> was not successful. And I, I can only understand why they did that. Because the guy was, there was no time in the Bible he caught fish. Except Jesus came. In fact, when Jesus met him, Bible said he fished all night. He caught nothing. You know, it's amazing. He caught nothing. It's not like he caught two. caught nothing. Night till morning. So when Jesus came, he was washing his boat and his nets. Frustrated. And Jesus looked at him and said, can you lend me your boat? He said, yes. This boat has been useless all night, so use it. And Jesus stood there on that boat and preached. After preaching, he told him, Launch out there. So it was only by miracle that Peter ever caught fish. <laughs> in the Bible. How come he was such a man that visited Cornelius? Who by social status and social pedigree, he should not be able to stand before Cornelius to talk. He generally is passing and fisherman is even failing in his business. But that glory is what furnishes the believer. But you know how to dispense it. You can stand before anybody. Glory to God. I say glory to God. 
we carry the glory of God. We must go forth and manifest them. We must, must show. The blind eyes must see. Deaf ears must open. Begin to trust God from today, from the 11 of this meeting, that the days for spiritual happenings in your ministry has come. It has come. It has come. Word of knowledge, word of wisdom, your eyes opening. That is the real, that is the manifestation of the glory. The real glory is inside of you. It's time to manifest him. Because every time you ever saw that glory manifest, there were results. Tangible results. Tangible results. Tangible results. In my days, the world shall see the glory of God. In my days, through me and through my ministry, people shall see that glory. They will experience, they will experience that glory. They may not be able to see Jesus come out physically again because he has ascended and is living inside of me. But they will see his acts. They will see his moves. They will see things through me. That should be your desire. Because when we are shouting, we are carrying the glory of God. It's not just for decoration. It is so that Isaiah 60 verse 2 will be fulfilled. That people shall see the glory. That the glory of the Lord shall be seen upon you. It shall be seen. And when it means the glory of God shall be seen upon you, it's not with the eyes of the Spirit. But that some of you, the only thing you have is revelation. And I can even tell you, don't have, you just have knowledge. Because if it's revelation, it will be practical. So I know I carry the glory. I know it. Even if you don't know it, I know it in my heart. There is that level. But when we talk about the glory of God being seen, it has to be seen. It means a blind eye has to open. It means cancer has to be healed. That glory has to be seen. I feel like I'm talking about friends. It has to be seen. My not having knowledge that it is there, it has to be seen. Because <laughs> if you actually have something, we will know you have it. Amen. Glory to God. Imagine a tank, a tanker is a fuel tanker is carrying fuel, full of fuel. And then we say we wanted to come and light fire there. We want, we want to set that place on fire. He said, Well, I know I have fuel. I know I carry fuel. If you know you carry fuel, go set the place on fire. It has to be seen. I feel what I'm saying it has to be seen. It has to be seen. And so you must have a desire that through these hands, deaf ears will open. Through these hands, blind eyes will see. Through these hands, cancer will be cured. That through these hands, miracles will happen. Through these hands, the helpless will be helped. That's what I want to say to you, friends. What God wants to do through you is beyond philanthropy. It's beyond sharing money. Because silver and gold are not the foundation of that house. The glory is. What God wants to do through you is beyond all of those things. Everyone on the side of my voice this evening, I would like you to know that God wants to bring you to a point where you begin to dispense and release that glory. Enough of all this, I just have it in my head. Christianity, listen to me, is real. We are not telling stories. When we say we carry the glory of God, it is not a story. It is real. And if people think you are just telling stories, you show them that it is not a story you are telling. I you what I'm saying? Are you following me this evening? When you get to your family and they don't want to believe what they don't take whatever you're saying seriously. They think you're just blabbing. You don't blame them. They've not seen nothing. But when you display your glory, the glory of God inside of you, when someone is sick and you put your hands, when you command that spinal issue to disappear and it disappears, if I'm seeing that in the spirit, someone I'm talking to someone, that issue with the spine that your mom has, when you command it to disappear and it disappears, Ah, the Bible said in John 2 verse 11 that Jesus displayed 
manifested his glory. What followed? And the disciples believed on him. So when you release that glory and display that glory, you say, ah, this one, you're a man of God too. We carry the glory of God. Let me close finally. You can never get to Bethel and be second guessing whether the glory of God is here. You will see it. You cannot enter Solomon's temple and thinking, I think the glory is here. At least you will see people fall down. I feel I'm saying. You can't enter Moses' holy of holies and say, well, I'm guessing. It's like, is glory here or not? You might not be alive to say it. Because you will die inside that place. Everywhere the glory was. When you get there, you will know. You don't, I mean, you don't even have to be spiritual to know. Things will happen to your eyes and your ears that you know that the glory of God is here. When people come around you, they shouldn't second guess whether the glory of God is here or not. It should be evident. It should be tangible. Are you following what I'm talking about this evening? It should be tangible. Nobody should second guess. I think, I think this guy is anointed. No. I think God is here. No. It should be tangible. And we're going to begin to pray even from now to the end of the meeting. Some of you will find yourself getting to, I told you guys, sometimes we get into vehicles, I get into places and when that I've entered a vehicle and there was a witch in that vehicle, not in the spirit, physically sitting right by my side and I knew and I looked at her and I told God under my breath, I said if, if you sent me, I don't want this girl to follow us on this, I want, I want to make Kong comfortable we went, immediately wanted to talk of the lady said wait I'm not going again, she came down I was not telling her why are you not going again, so I forgot something, I said wait driver please this girl, she has paid. Let us wait for her to come and bring it. She said, did I beg you? So I, was, I was laughing under my head. She laughed. And I laughed. She didn't say nonsense. That we are not quarreling from nowhere. And he just reminded me of the times that Jesus will see demon-possessed people. And from far, they will start shouting, Jesus, son of David, have you come? Are you getting what I'm talking about? That is the glory of God in manifestation. Get set for unusual testimonies. Get set for unusual results. We are talking about the glory of God. Oh, ha, 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 ha. You know, recently I was reading a book again. I've read that book many times. A book by Kenneth E. Hagin. Very small book. Call the glory of God. That's the name of the book. I was reading that book again. And he shared amazing stories about us. And he just, he just reminded me of all the good things, all the times. I told you guys when I was in Frosty, I prayed. I was in my room because those days I used to stay alone. And glory to God, I was able to stay alone there. So I could get on the fast for two, three days and not step out of my room. But I was coming out, sure. Because there was water was running rushing inside my house. I always come at around two, three in the morning, go to the well, fetch my bucket, fill up everywhere, you know that kind of thing, and go back. So sometimes for two, three days, the people have not seen me with their eyes. So one day they were sitting in front of a corridor, and they were. Don't ask me how I go to the toilet. My toilet was inside the house. Don't worry. <laughs> They were sitting in front of my house washing, and they were, I heard them conversing, not in the spirit, physically. And I was saying to them, says, ah, we never see this pastor since. He did so. One, one of them, I said, let's nobody not go and die inside his room in this compound. And we think that. So I was just laughing in the room. But you know what shocked me was, after they said that for some time, you know, I've heard this story many times. I opened that door and came out, walked past them and said, ah, on a well done, no. They didn't talk to me. I went because I was really done with the fast. I was coming back. And the other one said, ah, not be this thing we talk about now. I was like, I greeted the guys now. They said, they ran, literally. They said, we didn't see your door open. We didn't see you pass. Like, I didn't say they ran. They ran away. They, they ran literally from, because if you know my house in first year, I had my own personal corridor and then I had these gates. So they sit in front of my gate. I opened my door, open that small gate. That's what broke Larry. They, didn't, they said they didn't see me. So they ran. I, I, didn't make it, I didn't think about it. When I went into the room, I was not thinking. I said, ah, these things are possible. 
We can actually be invisible, actually. He said, ah, it's not possible. It's very possible, don't worry. <laughs> it's very possible. I don't ever try to convince you. But again, he was talking, telling a story about one girl that he wanted to marry. They were trying to connect who came up with to marry the girl. He said that he was, he was, <laughs> he was finishing the meeting and he saw a cloud coming from the back. The girl wasn't in that meeting that night. He saw so the cloud come and surrounded him. Of course, others were not seeing it. He said, he said for some minutes he lost consciousness. He knew he was still talking, but he didn't know what he was saying. And the Lord took him to where that girl was. The girl had gone with one man and had committed adultery with that man that night. And in a few minutes, 40 minutes or so, but again came back to the physical. He said, the next day, glory to God. The girl kept saying, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't come here. I was so sorry, but I said, I don't want I know. <laughs> the glory of God. It's, so, it's very tangible like that. I get the point. Your eyes can see. Your ears can hear. You can help many people with it. Many people. Manifestations. Sights and sounds. Things that can be seen and can be heard. Short legs growing out. Blind eyes opening. Demon possessed set free. The tormented set free. I'm trying to liberate you from that zone of wanting things from God to the zone of knowing that you self can be a distributor of that same thing. You carry the glory of God. And you must go forth and distribute that glory. Many will be helped. Many will be changed. Many will be changed. Many will be changed. The days are here. The glory days. The glory days. Put up Isaiah 60 verse 2. Let's pray with that verse. In my own days, in my life, in my ministry, my, the glory of God shall be seen in me. Now, we are not praying to carry your already house that glory. We are praying that in your own days, through you and by your hands, by your ministry, men shall see and experience and come in contact with those sights, those sounds, those happenings, those encounters, those things that will alter their lives forever. Lift your voice, pray wherever you are. Come on. I wish you're praying. Pray, 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 pray. Come on. Online on ground, please pray. It is the desire of God that upon you shall the glory of the Lord be seen. Upon you shall the glory of the Lord be seen. Upon you shall the glory of the Lord be seen.
pray. You have three more minutes. Take it. If there's a desire in your heart, that through me, as God has ordained, the glory of God shall be seen upon me. In Jesus' name we pray. Now hear what I'm going to say. These are the days that you must begin to, you know, these days in this meeting, must begin to take evangelism more seriously. Because it is in that going that you begin to see many of things I'll be talking about. I get the point. Many of you, you know, yesterday night I was watching and rewatching Zoe last year, the, the healing line night. What an experience we had. But you know what? Many of you might never be asked of God to organize a healing meeting. That's what I'm saying. You might never be asked of God to organize a meeting for casting out of devils or any such thing. But yet, God wants you to dispense and to display that His glory. What is the plan of God? We that, you know, the pastors and all of that are told to do some of these things are just there to serve as an example to you for what you now have to do when you get to the streets. Get to the streets. Lay hands on people. Preach the gospel. Cast out devils. Prophesy to people. You have to. You have to. Because that's where you begin to see the fullness of this thing I'm talking about. That some of you, because of this series, there will be special anointings that will come upon you. Right? That's one of you, one of the things that the Lord showed me is going to happen to you is you're going to be specially and heavily anointed of God to attend to issues that have to do with the skin. You will see boils disappear. You will see all those things happen. I can point. Some of you here, and I'm seeing that by the Holy Ghost. And as I'm saying it, you'll be getting, you know it's you. And when that day comes, I pray you are in service. Some of you, I don't go call upon you especially, you'll be able to minister to expecting mothers. That no matter how long the person has been barren, once you give a word, a baby will come. Some of you, this impartation is going to come. Through you, the glory of the Lord will be revealed. I can point. Some of you that will be the what's grace upon you. Now, whether it's a barren woman, barren man, important man, once you give a word immediately. This is what God wants that through us men will see. So you come in here hungry. I what I'm saying. You come in here how? With a desire to learn to be imparted, and to go and demonstrate the glory of the risen Christ. First in salvation of souls, and then in diverse signs and wonders. I'll show you a last scripture and I go. Joel 2 verse 28. It shall come to pass in the last days. Afterward, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Verse 29 said, also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days. Will I pour? Do you know, you know, sometimes when you read these things, you just, you just read them and you just read them. Uh, you know, do you know the gods it took for those prophets to prophesy these things they're saying? In those days, the spirit of the Lord only came upon selected people, people like prophets and priests. I get what I'm talking about here. Jewel now says, it shall come to pass, I'll pour it upon all flesh. And he took it a step further to say, even upon servants and maids in the house, all of them will carry this thing. 
This prophecy has not been fulfilled nowadays. The Spirit has been poured upon all of us. It's time to go and manifest this glory. The days are here. Are you ready? Are you ready? The days are here. I'm a blessing to my generation. I'm a blessing to my generation. I carry the glory of God. I release the glory of God. I dispense the glory of God. Through me, my world will be blessed. My world will be changed. Through me, my world will be blessed. My world will be blessed. I'm in the season. I'm in my season of heightened supernatural manifestations. The sick will be healed. The blind will see. Deaf ears will hear. Dumb tongues will talk. The cripple will walk. Demon possessed shall be set free. The Lord is moving through me. He's moving mightily through me. He's moving mightily through me. His glory is being revealed all over the earth. Through me, I'm a dispenser of the glory of God. Men shall see. Women shall see. The afflicted shall see. They will see, they will hear. Through me, the world will be blessed. The world will be blessed. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Do you believe those words? Pray in the Holy Ghost with them all over this place before we close. In Jesus' name we pray. So it means one of your expectations for this meeting, if you need to add it, add it now, that there will be much more supernatural manifestations through my ministry. Do you have it on your list? Add it if you don't have it. That before the notice 30 days, I will see much more manifestations. My ears are open to hear your testimonies. Amen? Because God wants that through you, his glory shall be revealed. Amen. Glory to God. Lift your hands. Let's just worship him. Holy, holy, holy are ah, you, Lord. We sing like three times then we take a closing charge. Holy, holy, holy are ah, you Lord, yes, the hair, the elders bow. Yes, the rim, worship you, Lord. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Please lift your hands. Let's do one more time. Holy are you, Lord. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Holy, holy, Please, holy, holy, holy are you, that Lord. That song has been singing in my heart since I said that teaching. Shemala Tarabataya. The and the angels bow. The Worship you, Lord. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. One more time. With your hands lifted to heaven, sing like nobody is saying. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. 
angels and the angels bow. The redeemed worship you, Lord. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. One more time, let me hear you say, Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Come on. Holy, 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 holy are you, are you Lord. Lord. Holy, 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 holy are you, Lord. Holy, 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 holy are you, Lord. The elders and the angels bow. The elders and the angels bow. The redeemed worship you now. The worship you now. Yes, 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 yes. Holy, holy, holy. One last time. One last time. Holy are you, Lord. Holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. The heavens and the angels bow. The earth and the angels The heavens and the angels bow, sing it. The elders and the angels bow. To redeem, to worship you now. redeem, worship you now. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Father, we honor you this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all your starting this evening. It's a new day, it's a new season in the course of this meeting. Be with us. Change us. Steer us. Empower us in the next 10 days of this meeting. That we will go forth and be a blessing to our world. That we will go forth and be a blessing to our world. That we will go forth and be a blessing to our world. These ones that you've said your hands will come up, your hand will come upon them specially. Let them know it even before that day. Show them in their dreams. Show them in their visions. Show them as they pray. Let them know what you are preparing and setting them up for. Let them see what you want to do with them. Those the ones that you've said that they will experience and walk into a special anointing. Let them see and know it before that day. Open their eyes. Let them see. Let them perceive. Let them know it. That when it comes, their hearts will have been ready for it. Lord, we are ready for everything you want to do. Use us to show forth your glory all over the earth. Hallelujah. See, I'm available. See, I'm available. Say, so God will use me mightily. How many of you have this as your desire? Do you? Hallelujah.